Well, thank you guys. Thank you for having us, Jubilee Stratford. It's been amazing. Uh, it's been years in the planning. I feel like we've talked about this so many times and it means the world to us to be here and to have been here all weekend and to now be with you guys. Some of you were here this weekend. Some of you don't know who we are or why in the world we're all four sitting up here. But a little bit about us. We are from uh, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, Glenn and I have been married for 41 years. We've known each other 45. Yes. And we have four children and 11, gr 11 grandchildren. And uh, kind of our backstory, we have loved God, served God all of our lives, and went into marriage uh, thinking we had all the right ingredients to have a glorious marriage. And um, pretty quickly found out that we did not know what we were doing or what we had gotten ourselves into. There was lots of wounding in our relationship right off the bat and never expected that never thought that could even be possible because of our mutual love for God and for understanding his word and his purpose and believed marriage was his design. So we thought we have all it takes to uh, make this thing work. And again, we found out pretty quickly we didn't. Yeah, and just like every other wedding that we've ever been to, we were excited about Happily Ever After, 24 hours before our wedding. 48 hours after our wedding, we were shell-shocked and thinking, what just happened? And uh, I realized that I'd signed probably a 70-year contract. I was 20 years old. I didn't know how long 70 years was, but it sounded like a long time. I assumed I'd die probably when I'm uh, 90 or so, although at that point I was hoping it'd be sooner. Um, because it was so overwhelming. It's like, how did we miss this badly? Uh, just all, we, we thought we had all the ingredients set up. And everyone around us said that we had all the ingredients set up properly. And we were clueless at how to actually uh, connect uh, in deep relationship. So that set up uh, 20 plus years of struggle, of pain. Uh, the first 10 years were horrific. The second 10 years were better because we learned how not to talk to each other. All of the marriage therapy, the marriage books, the marriage seminars at that time said you need to learn to avoid trigger topics. Everything was a tri trigger topic for us. So whatever we talked about, we ended up fighting about. Uh, by then we had several babies, and so we focused on keeping them alive, which we did quite successfully. Uh, but the second 10 years, and what's amazing is that the second 10 years of our marriage, we led the marriage classes because we fought less than everybody else did. So people looked at us and said, well, they should be in charge here. Uh, and literally we would do marriage retreats and uh, we were looked to as an example and nobody recognized, and we didn't really even recognize that, well, we don't have a great marriage, we just don't talk. We just live are living parallel lives. Uh, but compared to what was around us, that actually looked good. So somewhere a little after 20 years in, Phyllis said, okay, uh, this is not working. And she said, we have to make a shift, uh, which I definitely believed. I just didn't know what the heck to do. So she actually made me quit working my job. And I just admire her so much. I don't know a lot of men that can say, my wife made me quit working. And she said, you need to go back to school and you need to figure this thing out, figure out our direction, figure out our relationship, figure out life. And that's a pretty big challenge. I'm like, okay. And I love school. I'm an academic. Uh, I have been pretty much my whole life. So I got to go back to school and she took care of money. She took care of, uh, she built a bodacious business far, far greater than I'd ever built before. Uh, and I just started accumulating degrees and certifications. And what amazed me was all the modalities did not work. And once I was on the other side and I became a therapist and I opened my private practice, I started researching the research about what our role was. And then I was hearing from all these therapists that said that marriage therapy doesn't work. And I'm sitting there going, excuse me, I just spent a lot of time and money and energy becoming a marriage therapist. And now I'm on the other side of it and I'm hearing, because I'm sitting in groups of therapists and they're all going, eh, we're not sure that it really does that much, which for me, 
Trevor dozed off, sorry about that. I was talking too loudly, that wasn't fair of me. My bad. Um, <laughs> just lean your head on her shoulder. <laughs> well, um, did I lose my place? <laughs> I distracted. But anyway, I was just despondent because the therapists around me were saying, this doesn't really work, which to me sounds like a mechanic says, I don't know that I've ever really fixed a car. And I've been in business for 18 years. And I'm like, how the heck did you stay in business for 18 years? And you've never really, you're not sure if you've ever fixed a car? It, doesn't the word get out on the street that don't go see that guy? So that was what I was experiencing. And so I thought, we got to just start from scratch. And so I did, and I just started observing relationships, observing interactions, observing humans, and trying to figure out what causes people to disconnect. I've never been to the wedding where part of the vows was we're going to be madly in love for, I don't know, six weeks, six months, maybe a year and a half, two years, and then we're going to dissipate into some level of blahness. I've never heard that, those wedding vows. Maybe you have. I haven't. I've been to a lot of weddings. Every wedding I've ever been to, they're just like, oh my goodness, it's so amazing. I found the wood. It's so beautiful. We're going to live happily ever after. And then we know we have very hard data on this. Uh, within about two years, they're going to be uh, at least blah, if not worse. Uh, our research says that about 91% of marriages are unsuccessful based on their own self-report, which is pretty stunning. So you go to a car dealership, he goes, uh, this car runs about, <clears throat> I don't know, about 9% of the time. And you're like, what? He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it runs, it's really good. So you probably should buy this one. Don't buy that car. What are you, stupid or something? Move on to the next dealership. Find a car that runs pretty close to 100% of the time. But that's actually what the data uh, tells us is that marriage, and marriage is wrecked all over the world. Uh, relationships in general are, but marriage is pretty much gone uh, worldwide. Uh, I believe that, marriage, that God put marriage into the heart of us. That's the reason people are marrying. Because if you're looking at the information, if you're looking at the data, if you're looking around you, nobody should marry anymore because it doesn't make sense. All you have to do is look around you, and I don't know this group real well, but if you look around you culturally, the vast majority of marriages are unsuccessful. Uh, but again, I believe God put it in the heart of us. That's why we still do it. So when you say unsuccessful, the 91%, you're not meaning divorce rate 91%. Right. You're saying yeah. that within the marriage, there's a breakdown of connection. Yeah, the, the survey we did, it was a 10-question survey. Eight of the questions were throwaways. The two that, we, uh, that we're focusing on, uh, is we would ask people, um, are you living what you hoped for on your wedding day or better? And the vast majority of people go, Ugh, not really. You know, and then we say, uh, the marriage that you have, is that what you hope your children get to experience? And again, over 90% say, Ew, no, I wouldn't wish this on my children. Uh, that's intense to think that that percentage of the population is living in disappointment, is living in pain day in, day out, week, month, year, decades, which is very much where we were for a very long time. So I just couldn't believe it had to be this way. I, I spent a period of my life where I literally thought the reason marriage exists is because there were no video games at creation and from the beginning of time and God was bored and thought, well, what could we do that would be entertaining and created marriage and it's like, well, let's get some popcorn, sit back and watch the show. I genuinely thought that and I thought it was a cruel joke. I thought it was a horrible thing and I felt like we'd been set up because we had heard the message that marriage was good. And it wasn't. And then we started seeing all the people around us, they, their marriages were awful too. And literally, now when we married, we had zero examples, literally zero, of people that we could look at and go, oh, we don't know what's happening with those two, but we want some of what they have. We want some of that. We knew what we didn't want. We did not know how to get what we wanted. And again, that's the uh, multi-decade quest uh, that we finally found it, which is pretty exciting. So for many of us, you know, even right now in this room, some of you may be thinking, uh, why exactly are we talking about this on a Sunday morning? And some of you are not even married, so you're really wondering why we're talking about this. You know, it, it's easy for us to come into settings like this and, and really focus in on our relationship with God. And I mean, this morning, the worship, we come here to experience that. We come here to be lifted 
higher. We come here for that experience. And many of us have kind of given up on the relationship that we have with each other. It's kind of like we think one thing I can count on is my relationship with him. We, we express that through song, through even things that are said up here uh, this morning where we're like, he is the one, right? We can count on him. But all through scripture, we see that he wants us to be in relationship with each other. And yet there's so much wounding that happens in relationship with each other, whether you're married or not. There's wounding in our families. There's wounding in our friendships. There's wounding in even the jobs that we're in. And we believe that God did not set that up as a cruel joke. We actually need each other. We're just not sure how to get there. You know, we mentioned that this morning when we spoke, that that when you look up here in this morning, I mean, having just an incredible worship team makes such a difference, right? And, and to have, I mean, even, you know, I'm not a musician, so I'm always fascinated that there's like one guitar, but then it looks like to me there's another one, and then it looks like to me there was another one. And I know that there's differences in all of those instruments, but it's that harmony, right? It's that they, they play together. And I mean, even with the drums, it's like, oh, every piece of this makes our worship experience better. And we've kind of figured that out. We are drawn to that. And you go, okay, so in worship, we've figured a lot of things out. And we know even in our personal time of worship, there's a, there's a peace in that. There's a connection in that. And a lot of our years of pain and disconnection led us to believe we're just missing something. We're missing the tools that we need to be able to connect deeply with each other. And that is so much of what Glenn's research went into was understanding how in the world are we supposed to connect? Part of it is learning even how to connect with yourself, how to tune in, how to find what's truly happening with you. Being able to be authentic about your pain and your joy and your loneliness. And I know for me, um, and I think even with some of the testimony that happened this morning, is uh, that we discovered emotion. I was raised loving God, but very much you put emotion, you don't do emotion. Emotion is, is a bad thing. And then through Glenn's research, learning that we actually all have a region in our brain that houses emotion. That was mind blowing for me. I was around 50 years old when I learned that. And it's like, wow, you mean God made me to have emotion? It's a, it's a way for him to communicate to me and for me to be able to tune in to what he's saying. And that's a lot of what we talked about this weekend is just how to understand all that and how to bring that into our relationships. Yeah, yeah and let me uh, emphasize, because there's probably a few people in the room, of course, every human's unique, so there's a lot of variety, but probably a few people in the room are going, I'm not so sure about this. Well, if you're not so sure about God's heart for our relationships, our interpersonal relationships, go to a thrift store, uh, get an old Bible. You can get one for a dollar U.S. I think it's $19 Canadian or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but just buy one and get a black highlighter and grow through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation and mark out the Scriptures that talk about interpersonal relationships. There will be very little left when you get through. And let me make it abundantly clear. First of all, we love being here. A lot of people here that we know and adore, Trevor and Leslie, are very dear to us. Uh, this worship atmosphere experience is phenomenal. Uh, I always think of Isaiah 6 where um, the great prophet Isaiah says that he was ushered into a vision. I don't fully understand what that means, how it works, but that's what the scripture narrative says. And he says, I am undone. I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm devastated because I, a man of unclean lips, have seen the king, the king, Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. 
and he was overwhelmed. And the equivalent, not the equivalent even, but an example of that would be if I played LeBron James one-on-one in basketball. Wouldn't you pay a ticket to see that? That would be a joke. That would be silly. If we played to 100, could I score one point? Maybe just a fluke, I would throw the basketball up. But I would be so overwhelmed especially if my house was on the line. You know, it's like, well, Glenn, we're putting your house up as the, you know, the bet on the game. And here I'm supposed to try to win this one-on-one. It's just silly. There's no, Isaiah was overwhelmed because he says, I've seen the Holy One. So I think we're good in most churches at presenting that to people, which is wonderful and excellent and awesome and good and right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I want to make that abundantly clear. I don't want to take one uh, millimeter away from that. The problem is, Matthew 22, uh, a group of Pharisees came to Jesus, and one of them said, "Um, I have a question for you. And Jesus has been causing trouble like he so often did. He was just difficult to deal with uh, in the religious settings. And he said, what's the greatest commandment? And they thought, well, we're going to nail him here because he's going to make a mess up because all the commandments are valuable. All the commandments are good. And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, and then Jesus said, and he didn't use the Greek word identical, but he used a word that transliterated into English would probably be equal to. And he said, and the second commandment is equal to the first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we tend to focus on the first commandment and go, nailed it, we got that. We are presenting the Holy One of Israel to people, so we're good. And Jesus says, wait, what? No, whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. And he said, people will actually show up at judgment and go, oh, Jesus, we did it. We nailed it. Uh, We didn't really pay attention to people that much. I've actually been told that by church leaders before, uh, and I'm not saying that I handle the situations well, but I've had church leaders, leadership say, we don't have time to mess with all these people. We're trying to run a church here. And I think we've functioned that way for centuries, literally. We have completely missed the point of what church is. And just for the record, the word church doesn't even appear in Scripture. It was a made-up word. You can go study it, the history of it. And the word church was just made up to get the focus off of the people. The word ecclesia, which is twisted to equal the word church in English, uh, transliterated properly would probably be the word team, And my question is, do people show up here on Sunday and experience teamship? Or do they show up here and experience phenomenal worship? Amazing, beautiful, oh my goodness. The Holy One was presented so well and there was such an invitation to connect with the Holy One. Awesome. Did people experience teamship? Is there someone right here, sitting right here right now that will walk out that door and go, I saw the Holy One of Israel but I was not seen by the people. Mm. I was not loved by those here. Mm. Now, it'd be great if we could put on name tags that says, my name's Glenn and I feel lonely. Mm. Well, then you would know. Well, we don't know, so you have to ask. You have to reach out to people. And it's so important that we get that. You don't go down the street and take a left at the church. That's not a thing. And we believe that culturally. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's this big building down here. It's made out of bricks. No, it's not. There's no such thing. And I get it culturally, and I'm not fussing at you if you use that terminology, but we have to establish teamship. Everyone here this morning should leave here going, I'm part of the team. I was seen. I was heard. I was valued. I matter. And here's what we do, and I've done it thousands of times. I'm a terrible example of this. Someone comes and visits, they leave, and they never come back. And we say, well, obviously that guy didn't have a heart for God. No, he didn't feel seen. He didn't feel heard. And he may look good. I'm like, well, you know, he's obviously got everything together. He's just stuck up. He doesn't have a heart for God. No, he felt lonely. He came in and he didn't experience connection. That's the reason we're so passionate about this, because people are dying, and it's not because we don't show them the goodness of the Lord. We do that well. I'm not saying to take away from that, but we have to get focused on taking care of people. That's the call of God. That's what Jesus was all about, was taking care of people. Did he represent the Holy One? Yes, 
Was he God in the flesh? Yes. Did he want to draw people to Yahweh? Yes. But he knew how to love people, and I think we have to get better at that. Just, uh, Glenn, I've often, yes. I've heard you say many times that the connection codes is not something that you've invented, that people are using connection codes all the time. Um, just to what level or do we, can you give us an example of where Jesus used the connection codes? Yeah, well, one of the things, and Jesus was brilliant in just the way he interacted with people. Uh, one of many things that Jesus did, uh, he virtually never answered a question. He almost always answered a question with a question. Not always, but usually he would answer a question with a question. And I am convinced, and to the point the apostles eventually said, what is the deal? Why do you do that? That's so annoying. And Jesus said, well, let the, and even then didn't even answer their question. Because <laughs> he said, those who have ears to hear will hear. And those who won't, those who don't won't. So the, all you're going to end up doing is just fighting with people. So I think it is something we call the ooh. Those of you who are the, here, the, here this weekend know what I'm talking about. The ooh is just an audible response. Jesus was an amazing ooer. He was amazing at just being present with people. Uh, we always say, if nothing else, the ooh buys you time. Now, the ooh is just a label. There's dozens and dozens of versions of the ooh. But it's just something being audible with people. Uh, you think about what an incredible, silly way that Jesus handled the death, of, uh, death and resurrection of Lazarus. He shows up knowing what he's going to do. He already told him what he's going to do. I grew up with, in a household, and we were, and I'm sure my parents were doing the best they knew, but there was a picture of Jesus, and it, I think the inscription was um, the death of Lazarus, and there was one little tear trickling down his cheek. What happened with Jesus is he goes in, he already knows what's going to happen, and the scripture says, of course everybody knows the shortest verse in the Bible, says Jesus wept, and that's not a great transliteration, we don't have a good English word for it, but Jesus snotted himself. Jesus was so overwhelmed with sorrow about Lazarus and with Mary and Martha, knowing he's about to raise Lazarus shortly. We don't know exactly the timing on all that, but Jesus just ooed them. He was present with them, and knowing what was going to happen shortly. And I would think, and I thought for many years when I was a young child, that Jesus should have walked in with a trumpet blaring and said, I'm here to save the day, and he didn't. He sat down with them, he ooed them, he was safe for them, and he made space for their emotion. He made safe for their experience. It's such a beautiful uh, example of just sitting in someone's pain. We have a really hard time doing that. And we are quick to fix it. We want to fix it. We want to give the advice for it. Because we don't want to sit, just sit in the pain and cry with people. It's uncomfortable. And we also want people to just be healed of it and get through it quick. And, you know, this weekend just being here and being able to love on a lot of you and hearing your pain. And I think often we just think we're supposed to be over that pain. We're supposed to be through that season of pain. Because we just don't want to sit in it with each other. And man, what a beautiful example of Jesus just sitting with them, in their pain, crying with them, crying deeply with them. And what a beautiful example of, of just loving well, connecting deeply. And, you know, it is such a confusing story because we all know that he, he was going to raise Lazarus from the death, but it's an example of what we need to be for each other. Let me just sit in your pain. Let me hear your pain. Some of us don't even want to hear the pain of each other. And make space for it. That's a lot of what we talked about this weekend, is just making space for whatever you're experiencing. Yeah, and let me just mention uh, that, because it's important you understand we're not fussing at you. We're not criticizing you. We do that from a good intention. We do that from a good motivation. Somebody comes in, they're hurting with something. We want to help their pain quickly. So somebody comes in and says, oh my gosh, what a tough week. You know, whoo, I'm so overwhelmed. You're like, hey, God's got this. Just, just walk in faith. You're good. 
See how quick I fixed that? Wasn't that amazing? Are you impressed? I just, I mean, that took me two seconds. I just solved it. No, I actually made it worse. We won't take the time to go into all the science of that, but I literally actually brought you more pain by doing that because I love you. I care about you. I deeply do. And so I don't want you to feel pain. So I'm going to fix it real quick. There we go. It took us two seconds. One of the Connection Coast protocols is that slower is faster. In that setting, I'm going to slow down with you. I'm going to ooh you. I literally am just going to be audible with you. And I'm going, we call it following the energy. I'm just going to be present with you. What's amazing about, uh, well, humans, but what, to me, what's amazing about Jesus, I am convinced that Jesus didn't answer questions because he wanted people to figure it out themselves. I would rather ask you five questions and you figure out the solution than for me to tell you the solution. I'm fairly old. I've been around. I have a bit of experience. I could probably fill in the blanks for most of you about something. It would be better for me not to answer the question when I already know the answer. It would be better for me just to go, oh, wow. So help me get what happens for you there and for you to figure it out. Because if I tell you the answer, you know what's going to happen tomorrow? You got to come back to me again and again and again and again. I want you to know what to do tomorrow and the next day. And then we become more and more powerful people. One thing that I <clears throat> have found very interesting is that I have taken these concepts, I'm, I'm trying to live them every day in every relationship, and I'd have clients that come in to get their hair done, and I have them for like two and a half or three hours sometimes, and so they'll start telling me their stories, and a lot of times there's a lot of pain, and I, I will literally use all of these kind of things, and sometimes I'll even tell them about the connection codes itself, they get out the wheel and they'll look at it and, you know, we'll, like, as they're getting their hair done, like, I, it has nothing, I don't even know their faith status half the time. Like, it's just human connection. And so then I will have these kind of conversations with them and I'll literally just ooh them and hear them and, oh, wow, that is, sometimes I just say, oh, man, that is tough stuff you're talking about. Like, that. Yeah. some of the stuff that people have told me has taken me weeks to digest that they trusted me that much to give me wow. such a depth of who they are. Like, it's unbelievable sometimes. And after I just hear them, I do not have a degree. I don't have a doctor. I don't have any of the stuff that Dr. Glenn has. And you know what they have said to me? This, they have said to me, oh my goodness, this has been better than six months of therapy, this two hour hair appointment. That I have just, like, they have felt seen and heard. So this is, it's, it's real, it works. Um, and honestly, it's a privilege to have people be able to share with you on such a level. It's, yeah. And Leslie doesn't have to have liability insurance for that. <laughs> That's true. This is live streaming. <laughs> well, I do want to say that, and I do have, a, a, and I love academics, I love studying. Um, I have so many certifications just because I'm required to have, uh, they're called CEUs, Continuing Education Units. So I just have to do those, I'm required to, and so I just accumulate all this stuff. So now it's like, ooh, Dr. Glenn's so great. Well, I didn't actually even do it on purpose. The, the PhD part I did, but uh, it's just to keep accumulating stuff. But part of the design, and I, you want to share that part about how difficult you were? <laughs> yeah, sure, Because babe. it's genius that sure. it worked out this way. You mean, as far as the, yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, so when Glenn was doing all this and I was working and supporting us, um, that particular year that was the toughest for me was the year that my mom was dying. And at the same time that my mom was dying, my business uh, just quadrupled in size. Um, we opened up a new department and it went really, really well. And it was more than I'd ever been able to handle in my life. And I always, I'm a task-oriented person, so I never thought there could be a limit. And between my mom dying and my business growing, I um, did not have the tools on how to process all of the sad. And then with the business side, even though there was joy, there was also a ton of fear of making mistakes and um, fear of failure, fear of rejection, and uh, fear of mistakes. At the same time, Glenn was doing all this research, and um, I basically hit a wall at one point, and uh, just my body stopped functioning. So uh, when your body stops functioning, it gets your attention pretty quick. 
And the way it worked for me is I stopped sleeping. And you can't do that for too many days uh, before you think you're going crazy. So um, it was a scary time and for me. And Glenn uh, would, cat, would see me, like he would wake up in the middle of the night and I would be sitting at the foot of our bed on a bench. And of course that was always startling for him. And he would, you know, start communicating with me. And I, I couldn't even express what was happening with me. Like I, I didn't even have the words. Um, basically I would just say, I don't know. I don't know, I just can't sleep, I don't know. And um, at that time, he was studying the, just the brain and emotion, and he would say, um, well, babe, I, it, it seems that you're, you're really having a lot of sadness about your mom. And I said quickly, I don't have time to be sad. And he said, babe, I'm not trying to get you to be sad. You're just sad. And so then he... Um, shared with me the whole science, the, the five regions of my brain that housed emotion, which was mind-blowing for me because I had never heard that before. I believed you chose emotion, and I chose joy every day. That was my go-to. I didn't understand that emotion happens to you. I didn't understand that they were, you know, God created us this way. I didn't know any of that. So um, I was pretty resistant to everything he was teaching me. Extremely resistant. Okay, extremely resistant. Um, yes, I was. But once I really embraced what he was telling me, and I began, um, like, then I was like, okay, so now what? What do I do? How do I connect? How do I tune in? I don't know how to connect with my emotion. And um, he wanted me to read research papers or whatever. And I'm like, I can't, I don't, I can't do any of that. I don't have the brain space to read anything. So just make it super simple. Um, teach it to me in the easiest way possible. And, uh, and he did. And as I learned in those hours to express my sadness over my mom, uh, and the fear, that was the big one, the fear over the failure of my company I felt that shift in my body, and I fell into deep sleep. And after sleeping, um, it was kind of like, that can't be, it can't be that simple. And, um, but it was. And I, the sadness was harder for me than um, the fear. I still had a really hard time just expressing the sad over my mom. And um, that one took me longer, for sure. But these tools that we have found, uh, we've developed, I would say, the systems, but it was through this research and finding how we can connect with each other through emotion, not logistics, that changed things so deeply. And when I learned how to connect and tune in, uh, it was a life changer for me, and it was for us. It was like we figured out how to conquer conflict in just a very short amount of time. And that was so new for us. And so we went from lots of pain, lots of success in life, definitely had success, but a lot of pain personally and then in our relationship. And when we saw the genius of God and how, you know, he wants to connect with us emotionally, right? We just were missing the piece that he also wants us to connect emotionally with each other. You know, I think about what you led us through this morning. For me, those are emotional experiences with God. So beautiful and powerful. But I never understood that I could actually have that with other people. And that's the power of the connection codes, when you really understand how God coded us to connect with each other on that kind of level. It's really beautiful. 
So what you're saying is we have Phyllis's absolute resistance to it to thank for the development of the simplicity yeah. of things. Yeah, well, I don't know if I said that already, but I always say I'm the educated one, she's the smart one. Uh, I do all the research and the hard work, and then she figures out what actually matters and what works. And her hope, because literally, and I don't doubt that I was difficult as well, but, you know, I would bring home a, a research project, which is sometimes hundreds of pages, and I'd be like, babe, you, know, you should read this. She's like, I'm not reading that. I'm like, well, at least read the 19-page abstract. It's just amazing. She's like, are you kidding? No. She goes, narrow it down, make it simple, make it manageable, and I'll think about doing it. And it really was that uh, requirement from her uh, that she said, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, but I don't know what to do with it. You can babble endlessly, which I can. Uh, and she said, you can babble endlessly. And an hour and a half later, I don't know what to do with any of that. She said, make it simple. So that's what uh, I was required to do by my partner. Uh, and that's what led us to where we are today, which I think we're going to, do we get to do that? Present that? Yeah. Okay. We, we were at the, the Partners in Harvest uh, pastoral week. No. Catch, Catch the Fire. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, Catch the Fire <laughs> pastors uh, retreat this past week. And, um, and Dr. Glenn and Phyllis were, were going to speak. And it was phenomenal. The worship was amazing. And we were singing about the glory of, the God, of God, the glory of God. And, you know, immediately I imagined you know, a glory cloud coming in or the weight of his presence or him being present here with us. And, and that's all true. But then when Dr. Glenn and Phyllis were talking very specifically about the science of the way we're made, how God has created us with, and this is like the science of our minds, the, the emotions, I'm studying this going, his creation has glory. Yeah. Our relationships are glorious. And how are we going to steward them? You know, because I think it's, it's one thing to say, I'm going to steward this relationship with the Lord and draw close to him. But he has called us to steward the relationships within our family, within our relationships. And one of the things that's so powerful that I love when I hear Dr. Glenn and Phyllis speak is that they did not settle for it being less than what they could, they could have. They were persistent to push through. And through their vulnerability and through their walk together, all of a sudden, I'm inspired by, and you'll have to take their late night, but Dr. Glenn says at his age, he's looking forward to his places of intimacy with his wife. They're getting better. And I'm going, okay, for a marriage to get better with age and not decrease, because I think in our minds we think the peak seasons of your marriage or your relationships are going to be when you're younger, and then it's on a decline. And their testimony says the exact opposite. Um, I just have one question too. So when Phyllis was in that state of overwhelm where she actually didn't even know what was happening for her, um, and in the sense that you, you don't like necessarily take the connection code, well, hurry up, figure out this, do this, do that. Like, so can you just explain even like the just, like that embrace like on the, the beach the other day, like just that kind of a process for couples? Do you remember what I mean? When, when we were standing on the beach and I was talking to you and yeah. then you just like held me for a moment and like, like that and how it wasn't, you didn't pull out the wheel and make me do the wheel. Because um, I think sometimes we just need to know that that's okay too. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah, we're going to show you here in a minute the, I don't know if it's up there already, um, the core motion wheel. Um, and that's the, the tool that we designed. Uh, it's a two minute tool, four minutes for two people, two plus two is four. Uh, except in metric here in Canada. I don't know what it equals. Um, sorry, I don't speak metric. But um, the design of it was to be fast so that you can do it every day because we're exercising your emotional muscle. That's what set it up so that when Leslie shares with me what she shared with me, I automatically ooh her because I've been trained using this tool, this exercise, uh, so that I just ooh her. I probably could have given her a brilliant answer about her situation, what she's talking about. She didn't need that. She needed my presence. She needed my safety. She needed my partnership in her experience. And that's, and again, I'm that way, because I used to not be this way. I mean, 25 years ago, 
you would not have enjoyed me. Um, I was charismatic. I was very funny. I'm still very funny, just for the record. I um, want to make sure everybody knows that. Uh, but I was impossible to deal with, certainly in this relationship, but, but with all my relationships. And, and it's really you know, so painful for me to think if we had had that experience on the beach 25 years ago, you would have never talked to me again. Mm. And I would have walked away saying, look how much, I mean, I presented the, the word of the Lord to her. I presented God's truth to her. Mm. And I would not have looked back and realized you were bleeding to death. Mm. And then making it worse, in the coming days, weeks, and months, I would have been like, do you see how much I fixed Leslie? Like she isn't struggling anymore at all. Mm. No, 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 no. She's not talking to me. Mm. And maybe she's not talking to anybody. And I'm certain that there are many people that I annihilated so badly with truth, with mm. the word of the Lord, that they never opened up again. I would love to believe that's not true, but it probably is. My hope is that they at least went and talked to somebody else and avoided Glenn because they're like, whoa, he got a flamethrower to my face and walked away thinking he had accomplished something good. And I'd annihilated people, devastated them, crushed them, thinking, mm. and again, from a good heart, I really did. I promise you that. I thought I was doing good. Uh, but I do shudder at that to think 25 years ago, you would have just never talked to me mm. uh, again. I think that with... Um just understanding even what I was saying earlier about sitting in each other's pain, being willing and not quick to fix, not quick to uh, even encourage. But with what we got to share uh, on the beach with Leslie was just hearing, uh, hearing some of her sad. And in that moment, it was like you make space for it. It's like you're on holy ground hearing someone sad. And... I was there, but I was right, I think I was kind of right beside you, and and Glenn just leaned in, and he just held you. It was like this moment of just hugging you, and there were no words. There was not a, let me encourage you, let me give you an example of how that's played out in my life. Let me try to, you know, make it better. It was just leaning in. And that hug, that is what you needed. And it was such an automatic, it was like, because I think for you it was almost even a little bit startling as in how did you know, you know, that that's what I just needed. I just needed that space. And, and I think that we do miss that with each other, both, you know, if you are thinking about in your family, in your marriage, are you just a fixer? Or are you just that encourager? Or do you sit and allow the pain, the sad, the lonely to be expressed, the guilt to be expressed without judgment? Are we, do we know how to love each other well and to really um, just be, be there for each other? And that's a lot of what we've talked about this weekend. If you've missed it all um, and you're like, okay, I want to know a little more, we do have some books in the back, and there's many ways to connect with us. Um, so we're so thankful for these moments. We do want to end with uh, showing you practically one of the tools that we have, and um, it's called the Core Emotion Wheel, and it kind of goes back to my story. Uh, I needed it simple. Um, life was too much at that moment, and I, I didn't have the brain space for for anything but something simple. And the core motion wheel, as Glenn has said, it's just a two minute. And it's a two minute that you can do all by yourself. So you don't have to be married. You don't even have to have a roommate or a friend that you have to do this with. It's something you can do by yourself. You, many people do it in a, even with just a time of prayer as far as that connection with God. It's incredible when you can do it with someone else. And we want to do that um, this morning before we end. Will you guys do it too? Okay. Do we have time for that? 
Okay, fly by overview just to give you an idea, uh, and we won't go through all the research that led to this. You can go Google it yourself and spend five years figuring it out. But um, every human on the planet has five neural regions that house emotions that are the central command center of emotion. From those five regions, which are anger, fear, disgust, pleasure, and pain, we get eight core emotions, which is what's up on the screen. Uh, uh, so we divide pain into three different emotional experiences and disgust we divide into guilt and shame. This is true for every human on the planet. Therefore, I know it's true for you. And I know there's people in this room that are just like, oh, I'm not an emotional person. Yes, you are. The equivalent of that is you saying I'm not an oxygen-oriented person. Yes, you are. And you can tell me all day long that, oh, I, I transcended oxygen. I'm just, I'm spiritually matured past it. No, you didn't. You may think that, but it's not true. You did not mature past emotion. And we are centuries into an education that says that's the goal. It's not. You're not supposed to mature past emotion. There's no such thing. So, and again, some of you are like, that's not true for me. Well, do the research, uh, contact us, send us an email, whatever. So what we encourage you to do is to get good at doing this core emotion wheel every day. It takes two minutes, two minutes to do it. So you fly through it. You can do, do the core motion wheel faster than you can brush your teeth. I hope you brush your teeth at least two minutes uh, every day. So we're going to do the wheel. My response to her is just going to be an ooh, something audible. I'm just going to be present with her. I don't have to defend, argue, discuss, deny anything. Uh, she's conveying to me what happened for her. I may not even get it. It may not make any sense to me, but I'm just going to be present with her. You may go first. Please. Okay. Ooh. Um, well, I think I've already shared this one. I felt fear earlier. I've actually felt it multiple times going up and down these stairs. Yeah. There's no railing. Yeah. And um, no. I could just see myself falling this weekend. I felt fear. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Lonely. I think that um, for us, I know I'm the task-oriented mm. one. I'm the organizer. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel lonely in mm. that mm. so often as far as remembering everything and keeping yeah. us on track. Yeah. Um, sad. Ooh, this month has been mm. um, lots of sad with your mom right. um, being at the end of her life. Yeah. And... Um, I think just hurt too in being her primary mm -hmm. for the past 10 years, you and I have taken care of your mom. Mm -hmm. And I feel hurt in the way your family has disregarded yeah. me wow. as a daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. um, felt, I felt, I think I feel hurt just even that, or sad, I don't know, all of the above, that they're now showing up at the end of her life and right. they've, I've not seen them in 10 years mm -hmm. that we've taken care of her. Mm -hmm. um, I think, Anger, there's been probably a lot of anger in that mm. too. Yeah. Just all the time that was lost. Like yeah. we've wow. we've been they could have come so many times to mm. see your mom mm. and they just haven't. Yeah. Um guilt and shame. I think um <laughs> what pops into my mind is that the whole time we've been in Canada we have been fed very well, mm. very, very well. Yes. Feel some guilt and shame about how much yeah. food I have consumed yeah, yeah. Um, since we got here. Mm. So, yeah. gotta have to deal with that when I get home. Mm -hmm. um, joy, just tremendous joy getting to mm. be with Trevor and Leslie. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I've met them in person and just, yeah. I've loved them through Zoom, but this has been really, mm. really special. Yeah to be with them and their family. I love it, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, tons and tons of joy. Doing anything with you is mm. spectacular. Getting wow. to travel, getting to share with people, mm. connect with people. Uh, yeah. Spreading the Connection Co's message is mm. a dream. Uh, we see that. the power of it as it's spread mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, getting to be with people like Trevor and Leslie who are, we just adore them, they mm -hmm. adore us. Yes. There's so much joy in that, it's really amazing. Uh, I do feel guilt that I'm not better at just mm. covering logistical things. Yeah. Um, I show up in foreign cities with one shirt. Yes, um, you do. And it, it's just a missing component in my mm. brain somehow. Yes. So uh, it's amazing. I get that. Um, sometimes there's shame in that. A lot of times they're not. I've just kind of given up. I just <laughs> accept, yeah. accepted that um, it's not going to change. But I do miss things. 
Uh, even last night, uh, presenting the the late night stuff, some of the there were several slides that were off, mm, and um, yeah. you know I'm responsible for that, and I just missed updating it yeah. like I should have. Felt some shame in that. Mm, get that. Uh, I feel fear sometimes going into new situations, not the the public speaking or anything, but just that we'll convey mm. well, and that we don't miss. Yeah. Sometimes people walk away with a message that we never intended, mm -hmm. and a lot of these things are really touchy, so it's difficult sometimes to convey yeah, it so that yeah. people get the message, especially when it's a larger crowd because uh -huh. there's so many different people and perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I felt hurt when we were um, at the Catch the Fire thing, just a, a couple of comments that people made. Mm -hmm. felt really painful. Um, and I yeah. think they had good intentions, I don't know, but it just felt kind of uh, mm -hmm. hurtful. And there's sadness in that because I realized this message will revolutionize everything for True. people. Yeah. It changes their daily experience yeah. if we can get this out and people get hung up on one point and then they're like, mm. they throw everything out. It's like, nope, I don't, yeah. I don't get that theologically, therefore all of it's wow. pointless. And I just feel sad because I'm thinking we have to reach people. We have yeah. to touch people yeah. and be present uh, for them. Mm. Uh, I feel loneliness sometimes in this great quest. We're trying to reach mm. 8 billion people. Yeah. Uh, and so far we've reached less than 1%. So... And I'm old, so we have a lot to do. Yeah. And uh, it's a big task. And uh, we're accumulating a team around us, which is mm -hmm. working and helping. But uh, I, I do feel a lot of responsibility yeah. uh, to, to get the message out. Wow. Um, let's see. I said fear. Did I say anger? Uh, yeah. A lot of anger drives mm -hmm. me in that because uh, yeah. we don't have to do this anymore. We've achieved the American dream. I'm married to a very wealthy woman. and um, <laughs> But I'm driven to... To make this happen because we have to. Yeah, mm -hmm. We found the cure for relational cancer. Uh, and I believe it's a calling from God that this is too significant, too big yeah. uh, for yeah. us to retire. And I don't even play golf, so, you know, uh, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't even be worth it. So we're very, very driven in this mm -hmm. quest. Yes. Uh, I love getting to partner with you in it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 